Hi, everyone, and welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. If you're not yet familiar with YIVO, we are a special place for the contemplation and celebration of Jewish history and culture. One way to get involved with that is our wonderful spring classes. They're starting this month and also next month. We have 43 classes, which is a record for us. It includes classes in Yiddish language and also seminars in English on various topics in Jewish history. So go ahead and you can check out our classes on yivo.org. You can also see all of our amazing upcoming public programs, many of which are being held online just like this one. So wherever you are in the world, you're welcome to tune in uh, to our programs, also to our classes. Um, but today's program is celebrating the publication of a bilingual translation of The Clever Little Tailor. And we actually have the translator with us here today. Uh, David R. Foreman is the grandson of the Yiddish author, Solomon Simon. Um, he was first a calligrapher and a graphic artist, then a psychology research, a college professor, and finally has returned to his early love of writing. Um, and with us, we also have Miriam Udell, who is an associate professor of German studies and Jewish studies at Emory University, where her teaching focuses on Yiddish language, literature, and culture. So I'll go ahead and turn it over now to the two of them to begin our conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Thank All you. right. Thank you. It's wonderful to, to be with you. Um, so this is really a debut party for David's book. Um, and so I'm really here in capacity as, as interviewer and in person eliciting all the, the good stuff that David is going to share with us today. And I just want to insert one comment about the experience of reading this book. Um, my research focuses on Yiddish children's literature. So it's something that I know professionally. I like to say that I've probably read more bad Yiddish children's literature than anyone else currently alive. Um, fortunately, I've also gotten to read some excellent Yiddish children's literature. And this book uh, arrived over the summer when I had a five-year-old who was all ready to go on this journey with Schneidel. So it provided a wonderful convergence point for me of the professional and the personal. And I had this little focus group where I got to see in real time just how deft and delightful this translation is that, that David has really gifted us. Um, so it is a thrill to be able to, to be at this party and um, to ask you some questions, David. So before we even get into Schneiderl, the clever little tailor himself, would you tell us something about your grandfather who had one of those kind of ordinary and utterly extraordinary 20th century Jewish lives? Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I would, I'm so happy to talk about uh, my grandfather, Solomon Simon. And in fact, I've now given a couple of talks about the book, The Clever Little Tailor. And, and on this occasion, because it's YIVO, because, um, and because you're here with me having this conversation, I also wanted to uh, stretch a little uh, broader picture of Solomon Simon, who was a, a wonderful children's writer, and also more than that. So with apologies, I created a little PowerPoint, and I'm going to um, share it, assuming I can get everything to work um, with this. Okay, no, it, that's, that's the beauty of Zoom. It always takes one and a half tries. Good. So I have a little uh, Solomon Simon biography, Afeinfus, that is the short, sweet version. Um, and, and just on background for people who are listening, his archives, his papers, his letters, the records of his life, his unpublished manuscripts are in the YIVO archives. So for me, this is, this is a quite a momentous occasion to have this being sponsored by YIVO and to get to talk about his life because there is no better source in the world for understanding it uh, than YIVO itself. Simon was born in 1895 in Kalinkovich, which is now in Belarus, then in the Russian Empire, to a very poor family of eight children. His father was a shoemaker who made shoes but didn't make money making shoes. His mother was a bagel baker. Um, and he cites his mother actually as the most important influence on his intellectual life and on um, his becoming a writer, which I thought was very interesting. He, had, 
He was the only child in his family to attend a yeshiva. In fact, the only child in memory in his family to attend yeshivas. And he attended three of them. He went to Kremenchuk in the Ukraine, to Lida, um, which was a more liberal. After he, he wanted to read secular literature, it was forbidden. So he went to Lida under uh, Rabbi Rhinus to a yeshiva where that was permitted. And then finally ended up at uh, Hefetz Chaim's um, Musar Yeshiva in the town of Radin. Um, he came to the United States to avoid serving in the Russian army, ended up volunteering to serve in the U.S. Army in 1918 at the tail end of World War I. Um, went, got his high school equivalency early and then went to sort of combined college and dental school and in 1924 became a dentist. And then for the next 40 years or so, he worked as a full-time dentist. And also over the next 45 years or so, wrote 20 full-length Yiddish books. And it's, that's one of the things that astonishes me about him, was just how he could work all day and then write all night for years and years and years. Uh, he was married to uh, Lena, whom he called Leike. This is uh, her young. This is them uh, much further on at the wedding of their youngest daughter, my mother. Um, he was the father of three children. David Simon, his first translator, who translated Shmer al -Nar into the book The Wandering Beggar, which some in the audience might know uh, that book, though sadly it's now out of print. Uh, and The Wandering Beggar is about Shmerel, simple Shmerel, a kind of holy fool who makes things happen. And then his two daughters, uh, Judith and Miriam. In addition to being a full-time dentist and a writer, he was a director of a Sholem Aleichem folk shul, president of the Sholem Aleichem Folk Institute, a Tanakh teacher at the Jewish Teacher Seminary and also in a private group at his home, an editor, and a prolific writer of uh, newspaper articles, literary magazine, review, book reviews, uh, polemics about politics, and on and on. If you can think, if, if something had anything to do with Jewish life, he wrote about it. Um, and actually, rather than, than uh, use a slide to talk about that, his, obviously this was a man who was devoted to his work, full of energy, tireless, um, and had opinions about everything under the sun. And let's stop there. That's a sort of good, sort of cursory sketch of him. And then the 20 full-length books he wrote in Yiddish we'll talk about, I guess, in a minute or so. So as a way of bringing us into this particular book and the adventures that it describes, can you pull out a little detail that might connect the life with the book? Be like drawing on his profession. Did anything make its way into the clever yeah, yeah, little yeah. tailor? So there's two bits about that. One is just that um, he was a sickly child and he went to school late. And so he was in a, a way in the women's sphere longer than many uh, Yiddish writers might have been. So I think one of the one of the sources of his fascinations for folk stories was that uh, women's world of storytelling, which is probably slightly different than the men's world of storytelling. And so The Wandering Beggar, The Wise Men of Helm, his most popular book, um, and The Clever Little Tailor, which we'll talk about today, all are grounded in European folk tradition and folk storytelling tradition. So that's one one bit. And then the other bit is that uh, there's a nice detail Miriam and I were talking about. Um, you know, this clever little tailor is about this little guy who uses his wits to overcome larger evil doers. And at one point he goes up against a group of giants and he he slips them cookies with rocks in them and the giants break their teeth on them. And so it seemed, yeah, that little tidbit of um, him being a dentist and then sort of creating this little scenario where the hero vanquishes the, uh, the bad guys by breaking their teeth. I thought that was a sweet little detail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the story has a structure and I'm glad that you, you raised the point about um, the folkloric and kind of um, culturally prevalent styles of women's folklore specifically. Um, this is something that one of our foremost researchers of Yiddish children's literature, Naomi Prower Kadar, writes about some other collections of adventure tales. And she writes about 
the adventure story as a circle of return, where the character, um, first of all, a lot of these were, were published initially in periodicals. So we had, you know, short units that you could serialize and then publish the whole thing as a book once they had all appeared. And so a, a very frequent structure for these kinds of books was the self-contained tale, an adventure tale where each unit, each chapter is its own adventure and the adventures grow further and further afield as the book goes on. And that's something that I noticed with Schneiderl, where it starts out very local and then he ends up on these, you know, kind of fantastic escapades. Can you tell us more about the structure of the book or maybe even read us a passage? Sure, that, and I think that's a wonderful observation that, that actually fits the clever little tailor perfectly because he, he uh, you know, starts off as a, a plain tailor and then he, he goes out and, and actually catches a robber. No one else can do, he figures out a clever way to, to catch a robber. And then there's a band of robbers. And it's each time he uh, is victorious, he's rewarded by giving being given an even harder job to do, right? So from a robber to a band of robbers to these giants. And then and he comes home and then he goes farther and he goes to the uh, uh, the great fair in Leipzig in Germany and then even farther than that and so um, that that cycle again very well described it also describes uh, the wandering beggar or Schmerl Nahr, the story you know where simple Schmerl has adventures again that take him wider and wider out and in the later parts of both of those books, they, they begin with these kind of universal fairy tales. They also, in addition to becoming wider, um, and I don't know that this is characteristic necessarily of other writers, they become more Jewish as they go along. So even as he's going out into the broader world, uh, Schneider begins to encounter anti-Semitism um, first in a, a, a Gentile shopkeeper who sets up his Jewish neighbor to take a fall um, and then later on, an, an evil archbishop who um, oppresses all the Jewish people of his country. So, um, so Schneiderl is going out and um, dealing at the end with kings and armies and, and who knows what. Um, but he's also um, staying within the frame of his identity and his people. So I think that's... Um, and as far as reading a, a snip, I may as well start from the beginning. And I'm again, just so people don't have to look at my face when I'm reading, I will um, share that PowerPoint again. And so here, uh, oh, just to say one quick thank you to my publisher, Kinderlush and Publications. They have created a beautiful bilingual with the Yiddish side by side uh, with the English, you know, a book that with with new illustrations by Yehuda Bloom that are just an absolute pleasure to look at. And um, I'm just, I'm so grateful to them and so happy with the work that they did on the book. So um, that's that. And then um, I can read this actually straight from the screen. I'll start with the beginning of the book. And I think a talk such as this, we should at least hear a Yiddish word. So I'll begin um, with the Yiddish version and then I'll go into the English. Um, Amol, Amol, mit der Sach Joren zurück, kein Eisenbahn ist noch nicht gewähnt. Als Menschen haben gewollt fahren von einer Stadt in der andere, seinen sie gefahren, reiten dicker Pferd oder in Fuhren. Als man hat gedacht, über schicken Schreures von einer Stadt in der andere, hat man die Schreure eingepackt in Wegener und abgeschickt in der andere Stadt. In jener, in jener Zeit uh, hat gelebt der größte Seucher mit dem Namen Yisroel Fried. Er ist gewinn reich und geführt größte Geschäften. Er hat gehabt ein größte Geschäft in der Stadt Leschne und er fliegt schicken seines Schreueres in alle kleinere Städten städtlich. In derselben Stadt Leschne, auf der Ormer Schulgas, hat gewohnt ein Ormer Schneider, Schneider Uh, mit Namen Beryl Lepidis. Keiner hat ihm nicht gerufen mit dem Namen. Alle haben ihm gerufen Schneiderl. Once upon a time, a long time ago, before there were cars or railroads, 
When people wanted to travel from one city to another, they rode on horses or traveled by wagon. If goods were sent from one city to another, they had to be loaded onto horse-drawn wagons and driven there. In those days, there lived a merchant by the name of Yisroel Freed. He was rich and had many large businesses. His base was in the city of Leszna in Poland, and he used to ship his goods from there to all the smaller towns and villages. In that same city of Leszna, near the synagogue where the poor people prayed, there lived a poor tailor named Beryl Lepidus. No one called him by that name. Everyone called him Schneiderl, which means little tailor. So just a little teaser, right? And then um, a robber sets up in the woods and starts waylaying and in fact murdering the coachman that the businessman sends out with his goods. And uh, he doesn't know what to do. And Schneider volunteers to help him catch the robber. Yeah. So one of the things that really leaps out at me just from that passage, um, because it's something that I've observed in other uh, kind of folkloric type literature, meaning literature that is not actually folklore. It is composed art by that we can attribute to a known author, uh, but there's an attempt to kind of like uh, put a folkloric patina or sheen over the work. And one of the ways that that is accomplished is through um, through a, a kind of filmy generality, which is always intention with specificity. And it's really interesting to me how he moves back and forth between the specificity of naming these characters on one hand, but also using this kind of distancing language of the general that, oh, you know, yeah. he's he's in America and he's writing about that that old world back there, um, kind of remembered through a through a gauze. Um, so this is very much um, of its moment. In, in the 20s and 30s. You, you know, it's 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 interesting you said, you know, it's like storytelling with a patina of folktale, but someone else could view it as exactly the opposite, which is this is a ripoff of a Grimm's Brothers story with a little Jewish patina over over it. And, and in fact, um, one could tussle and argue with it both ways. But I think what he has crafted is a real a kind of synthesis um, that he he really does he wants you to know these were real people. And so he gives them real names and puts them in a real city. Um, <laughs> but he's not only not above borrowing from, he's eager to participate in um, those stories that are um, more general and, yeah. and, and well-worn. And, and the plots have been sort of tried and tested. And so he, he's, he, um, you know, he steals from more than one different well-known folktale in, yeah. in, in terms of the plot. But then again, the flavor of it, the language um, is all distinctly his. And, and that's something that I've noticed as I've gotten to know more of uh, your grandfather's work from, from book to book. Um, and it makes me wonder about how you see Schneiderl fitting into his larger intellectual concerns, because he's somebody who really took the the mental lives of children quite seriously. And I think that he did have an intellectual and a sort of a philosophical program that he was putting forward through his work for children. So can you talk about that kind of larger set of commitments? Yes, and, and in fact, I'm, I'm excited to because um, again, that's the part that I usually don't get to delve into so much. So first and foremost, I think it'd be useful just to see the, 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 the list of his books, right? So he published 20, I mentioned, full-length Yiddish books in his lifetime. I, I have a bibliography with probably another 150 articles published in newspapers or, or journals or letters and so on. Um, um, and so Again, he was an intellectual and he had a project or in fact a series or a set of projects. Um, so the list of books is um, overwhelming, um, but I was able to sort of categorize them in a few to just to show the sort of scope of his activities, but also then they begin to gel into a set of, um, of concerns and projects as it were. So he wrote children's storybooks, mostly based on folk tales adaptations, as we were just talking about. He wrote school books, which is to say 
he wrote a, an abridged Tanakh for children, uh, intending them to be used in the Yiddish secular schools. Very interesting. There was, in fact, a big battle over whether Torah should be taught in the Yiddish secular schools at all. Um, he also wrote uh, school books about uh, the children's, the childhood lives of Yiddish writers. He wrote for adults about the prophets. He wrote about Israel and Zionism. When I say he wrote about, he wrote about many, many things, but these are things he wrote more than one book about, right? So these are his enduring um, areas of interest. He wrote a memoirs, which were um, awarded and, and translated into English um, and uh, very highly regarded. Um, and then he wrote collections of essays, and those essays dealt mostly with problems of modern Jewry, um, how, to, how to take what was good in the values of Judaism and bring them into modern life and synthesize what we knew from science and, and, and from you know, sort of the other liberal philosophical virtues and, and try to synthesize that with what was good in Judaism and vice versa. He wrote about education and how to transmit these values to our children. And his big, one of his big ideas was that we needed a Yiddishkeit or a Yiddishism that was not just the Yiddish language, but that was that was that integrated daily life into our Yiddishkeit or the, or the other way around. That is, um, a lot of the school systems within which he was working thought it would be enough to give children Jewish stories in a Jewish language. And he, he really wanted a kind of modern rational substitute for halakha he want, and for the best midrash. For, that is, he wanted people to do Jewish things in community together. And he wanted that to happen a lot and not just send the child to school to get a little taste of Judaism after they were done with their public school day. Uh, what people remember are the folk stories. So, um, so then you asked, okay, so what was he trying to communicate to the children about this? One of these issues and I've already touched on was this idea that stories belong to everyone. And at the same time, they reflect the lived experience of a particular group of people. So he writes in his foreword to the book, Chacham and Makshanim and Aronim. Um, Translate the title for us. Uh, yeah, so there's a book which I translate into English as Wise Men, Fools, and Stubborn Mules. And that's the book out of which Miriam pulled the story to translate and include in her wonderful anthology, Honey on the Page. Um, and in the foreword to that book, which she selected from, he writes about how stories um, come from long, long ago when we were all one people. And then people took the stories and they moved around the world. And as people moved around the world and they developed their different languages and their different ways of life, the stories changed so that the stories could at the same time be universal and also culturally specific. So um, he told that to the children in a story in a forward to that book. But again, that was, that was part of a bigger thing for him. What were the Yiddish schools about? It was a kind of nationalism, and, he, and yet it was a stateless nationalism, and it was a nationalism, so it was an international nationalism, sort of contradiction in terms, mm -hmm. and, but also he was very critical of, of, and he didn't always live up to this, but of chauvinism, of the idea that we were somehow intrinsically better than everyone else. So he, he, he wanted it both ways. He really did want Jews to be better than everyone else. But he thought it was, it was um, very wrong to assume that we're somehow born that way or automatically that way. He, th he thought you could make a group of people better. And what made that, that, that the unique virtues of the Jewish people came from our statelessness and from the Talmud. Basically, those two sources were two of the most important. So this is, again, in his more intellectual writing and his polemical essays and so on. So how does that bubble down to the children? Well, for the children, he really wanted them to have pride in who they were, but not arrogance and chauvinism in who they were, to understand that we participate in humanity. And he, again, he, he agreed with humanism, with the humanist values, but um, it's hard to, to, to sort of walk that tightrope tight rope and, and have it both ways. Um, so but that's, that's why I think he was so fixed on that idea about stories being uh, both general and specific at the same time. And and that makes sense. I mean, I, he's really a figure that I would place at 
the center of our sort of broader account of Yiddish children's literature because so much was so much of what makes that literature exciting is the tension between universalist humanist impulses on the one hand and a specific Jewish particularist lens on the other, um, a solicitude about the history and present conditions and future of the Jewish people, um, a specific way of experiencing the world uh, in terms of time or um, sensory inputs having to do with Sabbaths and Jewish holidays. Um, and he, he sort of lived out the tension within one person, it seems to me. It's and it. in that in that introductory essay to the the wise, the fools and the stubborn mules, um, he starts out in this very kind of anthropological tone. Like it really sounds almost like an anthropology textbook brought down to kid level, made understandable for kids. And then really presents the um, kind of flowering of the specifically Jewish branch of humanity as the most natural thing in the world. Um, so that there's this kind of implicit message to his readers that your identity makes sense. Your identity as a Jew and a human being has a kind of larger coherence. And it's part of an exciting ethical drama that you get to live out in your own life. Um, I think that and that's part of- he's trying to give that to seven-year-olds, right? And he's trying to give it to 17-year-olds <laughs> and to make them laugh, right? right? And to, to make it fun and to make it funny. Okay, so in, on that note of making it fun and funny, I wonder if you would do us the honor of reading from your translation of um, A Deal's A Deal. I would be honored. I was so glad when I proposed it that you were willing to um, save me something from the Shlema Simon canon that I could uh, get my grubby little translator hands on. Um, and I will go ahead and read this, but if you would like to hear it done much more artfully along with five other stories and poems from uh, Honey on the Page from my anthology. I believe Jane is dropping a link into the chat. There we go. Um, for a production that went live in January from the Alchemist Theater in Seattle called Somewhere Very Far Away, uh, material from Honey on the Page. So here we go with a story that was originally called An Open Atir, An Open Door, that I have titled A Deal's A Deal by Solomon Simon. It was a cold, rainy autumn night in Helm. The wind had torn open door and shutters. In the middle of the night, Avram heard the door banging. So he woke up his wife, Myrtle, and said to her, Wifey dear, did you lock the door? Myrtle replied, Hubby dear, I thought you had locked it. I didn't, said Avram. Go and lock it. You go and lock it, said Myrtle. Said Avram, no, I'm not going downstairs in this cold. Surely you know that when I say no, it's no, said Myrtle. The whole world knows that when a man is a rabbi, his wife is called a rebbitzin. When a man is Mr. Shoemaker, then his wife is Mrs. Shoemaker. You're Mr. Stubborn, my husband, so that makes me Mrs. Stubborn. I too am staying in bed and not moving a muscle, said Avram. What you say makes sense. You know what? Let's make a deal with each other that whichever one of us is the first to speak will lock the door, said Myrtle, deal. So they lay there in silence. The wind blew, the open door banged and banged until the house shuddered, but both of them kept quiet and neither moved a muscle. The rain poured, the wind blew inside the house. It was wet and cold enough to drive away wolves, but Avram and Myrtle didn't budge. Just before dawn, husband and wife heard footsteps and human voices. Thieves were talking. One thief said, just look at that open door. Let's go inside and see what we can lift, said the second thief. Don't talk so loud. Maybe the owners are home, but they're sleeping. 
Don't be ridiculous, answered the first one. You hear how the door's banging? That would wake the dead. Chances are nobody's home. Come on. Husband and wife heard the thieves come into the house and start to empty out all the rooms. But husband and wife didn't move a muscle. The thieves did their work and packed up everything they could get their hands on. Husband and wife knew their home would be left naked and bare, but they didn't let out a peep. The thieves gathered everything together and took off. They left the door open as they found it. Night passed and morning came. Husband and wife got up and looked around. The house was empty. The thieves didn't even leave so much as a saucepan to cook up a bit of porridge for breakfast. Husband and wife exchanged glances but remained silent. Myrtle went out to a neighbor's to borrow something for breakfast. But as for closing the door, that Mrs. Stubborn didn't do. She got to the neighbor's and lingered there for a long while chatting, as women will. Meanwhile, a barber was passing by the house with the open door. In those days, barbers would go from door to door asking who wanted a haircut and clipping the hair of both children and adults right at home. The barber saw Avram sitting silently on a chair in the middle of the house, lost in thought. So he said, perhaps you'd like a trim, Reb Avram? Avram kept quiet and didn't answer. Well, when you don't say no, that obviously means yes. So the barber laid out his towel, his scissors, his bowl, his soap, and his razor, and went about the job. He snipped and snipped, and then he asked, enough, Reb Avram? Avram was silent, so the barber went on clipping. Avram began to look like a shorn sheep. The barber asked, enough? Avram was silent, so the barber thought, what kind of a hard case is this? Well, so be it. There's only one thing to do. So he took the soap, lathered up Avram's head, and shaved it. Having done so, the barber said, such a long beard doesn't go with such a bare pate. Trim it a bit. Avram was silent. Mr. Stubborn through and through. The barber started in on his beard, cutting and cutting, and Avram was silent. The barber spared no effort in shaving off Avram's beautiful beard. Avram kept silent through it all. The barber gathered his towel, his scissors, his bowl, and his soap and said to Avram, well, Reb Avram, I've trimmed and shaved you, so pay me. Avram seethed and boiled inside. Who had asked the barber to cut and shave his hair? And what's more, he wanted to be paid for his lovely work? Some nice new look he'd gotten, a Jew without a beard and sidelocks? How could he show himself in public? Thus reasoned Reb Avram, but he kept silent. He surely wouldn't be the first to speak. The barber complained, I'm a Jew, a poor man, I've worked, now pay me. The barber talked and talked, but Avram said nothing. Eventually, the barber got angry and said, is that how it is? You're stubborn? You don't want to answer? I'll teach you a lesson. The barber didn't hold back. He went out into the street, picked up large handfuls of mud and began to smear it all over of Rum's shaved head and face. And then he left the house without even shutting the door. No sooner did the barber leave than Myrtle of Rum's wife came in. She took one look at Avram clapped her hands together saying, woe is me, alas and alack, what did they do to you? You look just like a demon. Avram got up from his chair, said very calmly, you were the first to speak, so please go and close the door. Myrtle went and closed the door. After all, a deal's a deal. A deal's a deal. That's it. Um, when I teach this today, I tell my students, consent culture has really changed. It's no longer the case that just because someone doesn't say no, it, it means yeah. It means yeah, right. Silence means consent. I think that that was taken somewhat out of context. Even yeah, yeah. Um, um, wonderful. Thank you so much for reading that. I, I really enjoyed it. it um, and I love that there's two variations. Since he talks specifically to children about variations of the two, there's two variations of that tale. So he told it again in a slightly different way later on somewhere else. So, um, you know, we have both of those. Um, and then just one last call back to the, the, the conversation we just had before. Um, one thing you didn't translate was the subtitle. And the subtitle is a Japanese Helmer story. I think, I think something like that. Um, yeah. And, and in fact, I found a variant of this tale in a book um, based on the Hundred Parable Sutra, which is an at least 1,500-year-old uh, set of Buddhist stories that made their way from India and to China and then from China uh, to Japan about a wife and a husband arguing over a cake and uh, deciding that the first person to 
talk would get, or no, the, no, the, the, the last person to talk would get what they want. Um, I'm so grateful that you told me in time for the, the critical <laughs> study that I'm writing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Email me. I'll give you the details on that. Okay, it's, great. Good. Um, and you know, that, that really speaks again to this very delicate balancing act that, that Shlema Simon was trying to enact regarding the place of Jews, Yidden and Yiddishkeit, um, that they that we are a culture akin to other cultures and that our folkloric materials can be in conversation with theirs. So that implicit parallel between a Helm story about the town of fools and other fool traditions in other cultures where he's saying we have something distinctive with a particular Jewish inflection, yet comparable to these other materials from distant foreign cultures. Um, yeah, it's amazing you brought it up and in just that way, because in Yivo's archive, there's a letter from Simon to, um, and it's not addressed, it's a dear blank, it's actually a draft of a letter and it's in labored English. Um, most of the letters, of course, in his collection of letters are letters people sent to him. But sometimes he kept copies of his own letters or people returned them to him or to his archive. Um, but in this case, his his letters there because it was a draft, you know, that he didn't send for it. He maybe sent later. And it's so it's to a review, a would be reviewer. And he compliments them that their review of um, the wandering beggar years and years ago was the best one because this reviewer was the only one who mentioned that it was a variant of the Rainer Tor story, of the story mm -hmm. of the holy fool, but the Yiddish version, the Jewish version. Um, and now he has published The Wise Men of Helm, and he wants to make sure that there's a reviewer who's sophisticated enough to mention and explicitly say, this is our version of the Abderites or of the Gotham tales they have in England. Yeah? And so again, he's, he's saying all these other countries have these stories about a, a city full of fools. And now the wise man of Helm, this is my, uh, my version of that. So again, you, 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 know, you, you can see the importance to him again of this idea of that balance between the universal um, and the specifically Jewish. So I presume that you came across that either because you had it in the family or because it's in the Yivo archive. Can you tell us about what else is there in the archive that's pertinent to Solomon Simon? I would be happy to. First of all, um, what a lovely thing this is for me to be able to thank YIVO in this way. Um, I went, I was privileged enough to attend YIVO's intensive summer program in Yiddish twice. Some of us take longer to learn than others. Yeah. So, you know, eventually it, it gets, it gets in there. Uh, no, so I, I have them to thank for a, a chunk of my Yiddish language learning. And while I was there, yes, I went upstairs to the archives and I got to see and look through and work with a little bit my grandfather's papers that are there. So I saw that unsent letter that I mentioned to you, but I also found unpub unpublished manuscripts, uh, published manuscripts, but that I didn't have a copy of anywhere. Um, you know, it's harder to search the Yiddish periodical world um, we, than it is in English. People take for granted that we can, if someone wrote articles years and years ago, we can find them. It's a little bit harder with Yiddish. And so when there are clippings from the daily newspaper in Buenos Aires, where he published in the 50s, um, those are, are, are articles I'm very happy to have because I couldn't find anywhere else. So the YIVO archive is a treasure. And one could, if, if one were to wish to write a full auto, a full biography of him, um, the papers of the Sholem Aleichem Folk Institute, you know, the, the umbrella organization for all the, that group of Yiddish schools is in there. Um, his publisher and the Kinder Journal, the Jewish uh, magazine for children that he edited, it's all in there. It's amazing the resources that they have. So a shout out to Yivo, just, it's an amazing place uh, and they have amazing resources and um, more and more of it is gradually going online. So um, really what, what a wonderful gift to all of us who are interested in Jews and Judaism. Um, so um, what else can I say about that archive? 
in in his uh, in the boxes of his material that I've been able to look at, um, I've learned more about him. I've learned a little bit about who he was friends with. I've learned about um, you know his personality. I started to talk a little bit before about how committed he was and how opinionated he was. Uh, what I left out was just how how incredibly loving and how incredibly difficult a human being he was. Not to me. I mean, to his grandchildren, he was the perfect grandfather. He loved us. He adored us. He was wonderful. And he told us stories. What could be better? Um, to work with was, was another story. So I'm reading through his letters and I see a letter from Zisha Weinper, the poet, who was also an editor, um, starts his letter out by saying, um, when a man loves a girl, he forgives her much. And so it is with you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, in an art, in a, in a letter he got from Alfred Kazin, Kazin says to him, "You next time." So he's writing to him, replying to a particular letter. He says, "Next time, try to find something good in me. But if you can't, and I suspect you can't, write to me anyway." Right. So this is this lovely. Um, you know, his friends understood. Um, you know that that he pushed and pushed and pushed on the things that he uh, didn't like. Uh, but that it was often done it was done out of love um so you get you get a picture of of his humanness um and of his place in the yiddish literary world such a connected community letters from santiago and from buenos aires from montreal from vilna from california um you know um and all the writers wrote to each other and they sent each other their books um, so you get a feeling for things may not be specifically about him, but just about his whole uh, his whole environment, uh, uh, the world uh, that he worked in and traveled in. Um, turning for a second to Israel, because that's a sort of sore point that somehow um, I think has to be at least touched on. So he wrote a, a two books about Israel, as I mentioned earlier. Um, he was a Zionist skeptic, but in such a way that even the anti -Zion, the, the Zionists didn't like him, the anti-Zionists didn't like him. He, he wrote before he went to Israel about the um, prophetic tradition of speaking truth to power and the purity of the desire to live a holy life in the day to day, coming into conflict with state power. He thought basically it was impossible to have state power and yet be uh, completely moral and completely Jewish at the same time. Then he went to Israel. When he went to Israel, Bible verses sprung into his head everywhere he looked. He would look at a mountain and some, a psalm or something about Devoira would come into his mind and he would write uh, about that. He loved the people he met there. He couldn't believe how committed they were to their Judaism, which was Zionism, um, but to, they were giving their whole lives to the future of the Jewish people. And he didn't see that in America, so he envied them. But at the same time, he worried terribly about uh, what would happen between the Jews and the Arabs. And he worried even more, if that's possible, about what would happen to Judaism in the diaspora once there was a state of Israel. Because the deal in diaspora for hundreds of years had been, Mashiach will come, but later. Now we have to make a good ethical life here. We have to create here. We have to produce here we have to make our lives the best they can be here and the someday will be someday um if you were religious the shekhinah was with us in our exile and this gave meaning to our suffering and we were going to redeem the whole world and that gave meaning to our suffering once we became secularized all that was gone and there was no meaning in the suffering in exile um and now that there was a state of israel we don't even have to wait until the world is fixed in order um, for there to be an Israel. And he was worried that the whole project, therefore, of fixing the world was going to go into the dustbin. Um, so I figured that point of view would never please anyone. For a secular Jew to argue, uh, we shouldn't take a nation state because the Messiah hasn't come yet. You know, uh, the secular Jews were not going to like that idea. Um, the the uh, people who hated Israel were not going to like the songs he sang about the people he met there and the projects that they were engaged in. Um, the people who loved it were not going to like his very sharp criticism of their anti-Arab bigotry and violence. Um, 
And what I learned when I went through the archives was, it, you know, so what the, what the story the family had told me was he was doomed to be ignored. Well, he wasn't actually ignored. And I learned in the art, I see a publisher's brochure with glowing quotes from Charney, from um, Rozhansky, from De Lebedeker, from uh, Rav Melech Ravich, that is from, from various writers. These are tastemakers. I mean, these are yes, real arbiters big, of big Yiddish shots, culture. The Yiddish cultural world, glowing blurbs about his book. Um, and in his, the letters also, people writing to him, very approving. And it was serialized in Die Presse, in the daily newspaper in Buenos Aires, not just for days, not just for weeks, but for months. Practically the whole book comes out in article form in that newspaper. So this is not a, a voice crying in the wilderness. This was not a man destined to be ignored. People heard what he had to say. And in the end, the majority of Jews did not like what he had to say and reject it. Okay, but he, he had his hearing. And so, uh, again, um, thanks to the archives, I, I, I have a slightly different uh, picture of him and of his experience and of his thinking and writing in his time. Um, it's a treasure. It's really a wonderful, wonderful yeah. thing. I think we have some uh, questions awaiting us. Oh. Mostly you have questions awaiting you in the Q&A. So let's um, turn our attention there. Okay, and I think Jane was going to help us out with that. Yeah, so if anyone has, still has a question they want to add, feel free to type that in the Q&A. Um, a few we can get started with. Um, so someone wants to know, it sounds as if um, Solomon Simon's training at his Musar Yeshiva was formative to his worldview. Um, do you know more about that Yeshiva and his experiences there? Um, he writes extensively about that period in his life in the second volume of his memoir. Uh, in Yiddish Zweigen, in English, in the thicket, I think it's pro um, it's most certainly out of print, but most many libraries with good Jewish collections would have that book in the thicket, and uh, you might be able to find a used copy online. So he writes about the tension between the zeitgeist, where the best and the brightest were rejecting Judaism, and arguing with him that he was ridiculous for going to this yeshiva, and 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 his you know, going to the Sabbath table with the Chafetz Chaim and hearing him give his uh, uh, take on the, the weekly portion and, and the other studies that he did there. So that intellectual ferment is well described actually in, in his autobiography. Um, another question, someone wants to know if he wrote children's stories about the Holocaust or if he had any opinions about that as a subject for children's literature. It's really, Interesting, but it, you know, if uh, let me just go quickly back to my screen share. Um, you can almost split his um, his writing career in half in that um, the first one, two, three, four, five, six or seven books he wrote were all for children, and then after 1945, most of it is for adults, although there is still some children's books in there. It got harder, I guess, to write for children after the Holocaust. Um, although, um, you know, he did, a couple of his books did, did come out after he didn't. And there were fewer readers and less of a publishing and distribution network. That's right. And in fact, I mean, in, again, back to the archives, there are letters between him and Shmuel Bush, uh, Bush, Bastomsky, the, yeah. the great uh, pedagogue from Vilna. Shlema, Shlema Bastomsky. Uh, Bastomsky, um, who yeah. was working, um, on creating curricular materials for the children, um, in the Yiddish schools um there you know date of death 1941 so um i think one of the one of the things i hadn't really understood people talk about how the writers lost their readers but they they lost their colleagues they lost the they lost all the, the infrastructure right the infrastructure and and half of just the human ties that had bound this international project of uh, creating yiddish culture uh, together um, and who wasn't taken was traumatized. So um, he did not write, uh, and, and I don't know of any of his reviews which speak to that issue of writing about the Holocaust for children. I know now many Jewish children's books are about the Holocaust and it's, it's kind of refreshing to get one that, that isn't, um, you know, and um, I think that would have been distressing to him. We have a question about 
someone you mentioned in the beginning about his interest in having Jews have a certain pride, but not arrogance. And someone wanted to know, based on that, if your grandfather had any contact with Mordechai Kaplan. I grew up using Mordechai Kaplan's Haggadah in our family Seder. Um, he admired Kaplan. And this the formula of um, Judaism as the religious civilization of the Jewish people of, is is potentially consonant with what the Yiddishists were trying to do, certainly. Uh, and so it was it was um, it was sad to find a letter in his archive um, from Kaplan, giving the reasons why he was not going to review Simon's book, Toch uh, Yiddishkeit, which was that if he was to review it, he would have to um, include the fact that not only had Simon gotten uh, all of Jewish history wrong, but the conclusion that he drew from it was also wrong, something like that. He was So um, Kaplan moved to Israel and was committed to Zionism, and I think he was antagonized by uh, Simon's view of um, of Israel. So, um, you know, there there are there are a lot of uh, there are relationships that start out warmly and don't end that way. There are some nice letters from Isaac Besheva Singer before Singer read uh, my grandfather's savaging of his uh, <laughs> of one of his books in in the Jewish press. Um, you know, and then that was that was done. So. Yeah, but the Kaplan, I think, I think he did admire Kaplan, even after uh, it was clear the, that it was not reciprocated. We have a comment from someone appreciating the challenge of being able to read the Yiddish side by side with the English, and also a comment from someone else noting that it, it's difficult to read Yiddish characters, especially without um, any background in that. So I'm curious to hear your perspective on you know, what's it like to read something in the original versus the translation? What does it mean to have it side to side? Um, how can that perhaps influence today's crop of learners of Yiddish or today's crop of learners of English? I am so, well, actually, why don't I leave it to you for a second, Miriam, because you said you've read this to children. I assume you read it to them only in English. Did you read them a little of the Yiddish so they could hear what is said? I, so I made up a melody for Schneiderl's little song that he sings in the forest. Um, my my husband sort of laughs because to him it sounds like I, I made up this kind of Tin Pan Alley little ditty for it. So I've been singing the ditty in Robert Yiddish. Robert right, Robert <laughs> from Robberland, come here and feast your eyes. Um, so that I also read in Yiddish, but most of the prose um, I just read in English. Um, but I mean, I have not been, I've been off on a fellowship leave writing this next book this year. I've been very fortunate to be doing that. I haven't been in the Yiddish classroom since Schneiderl has been out. I can't wait to teach it and to teach with it. I've gotten some good responses and reactions from a couple of Yiddish teachers who have been using it. One person who is in uh, community education, not at a university, said that uh, she had not seen her students engaged with a text like that before. So um, I think for some learners at a certain stage, yeah. when you're, you've had enough that you're ready to read real things and not just little pretend excerpts of stories as they're planted in the textbooks, but you wanna read an actual cultural product and a story that has a little bit of meat to it, but you still don't have enough of the words. And so you would have to run to the dictionary maybe once, maybe twice a sentence. That having the English texts right there at that stage of learning, um, it's not a substitute. It won't, it won't take away any of the Yiddish that you already have. Um, but it, it, it allows you to take it in a little bit of a bigger chunk and, and get a little more of the feel of it. So I think it's, I think there should be more of such things. I think it, I, I really, um, uh, again, I was so happy that Jordan Kutzik and Jugendruf uh, in there with their press Kinderlushen publications want to publish Yiddish and English side by side um, because I, I, there is a great need for, for that kind of book. And to have, again, to have a well-told children's book that does not talk down to children in that format means that um, the vocabulary is not just way over the learner's head but it also isn't infantilizing the experience of reading it. So it's, it, it has hit the spot 
uh, again, with learners at that particular stage. Yeah, and I'll add to that um, with with the anthology that I put together. It's a, it clocks in at about 350 pages. It was not practicable. Nobody would publish that as a side-by-side -side bilingual edition. But um, I have collated all of the originals electronically. And if people get all the way through The Clever Little Tailor and they find themselves wanting to do more reading of children's literature, if people just send me an email, I'm very happy to send the original Yiddish files as well as a document that collates the page numbers between the Yiddish and the English. It's wonderful to have that. It is, uh, yeah. And, and, and the, the Yiddish, so much Yiddish children's literature is available for free at the Yiddish Book Center for free downloads. And so, yeah. again, some have, uh, you know, those of yours have English translations. And then when you outgrow that too, then there's the whole world of Yiddish literature. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, and, and maybe that's a bit of why my little uh, needle about how, well, you didn't translate this up. We can never give all of it, right? Um, we, we can't give all of it over. We give as much as we can as translators, but, but it's not Yiddish. Our English is hopefully a, a good English story to read, um, but it's, it's uh, the hope is the reader will want to come to Yiddish. I, I, I see that as the translator's role is not just bringing Yiddish literature to English readers, but bringing English readers to Yiddish. You audience members are curious to access the book in a few different formats. We have a question about if it trans a plan for it to be translated as well into French or Spanish, um, or if there's a possibility of an audio uh, recording for the book. And there was a third question, I think, about transliteration in there, um, maybe at the very beginning, I'm not sure. Um, I have heard rumors about French, but I don't, I don't have anything solid. But I think that might be the next language to come up, partly because the Naborski family contributed to this, uh, the creation of the Clever Little Tailor. So the Yiddish is not just a photocopy of the original Yiddish book. Uh, the spelling has been modernized. Um, my grandfather also was a Litvak, which means that there are certain grammatical structures that were different than in standard Yiddish, and he may have woven a little bit back and forth from one to the other. And so um, they kept the colorful Litvakisms, but they also um, uh, standardized uh, certain other things. So who did that? There's uh, um, Yitzhak Naborski, who's the head of the Medem, or was the head of the Medem Cultural Center in Paris. Um, his granddaughter actually typed out the Yiddish text, and his son um, did some of that editing and, and cleaning up around the edges. And I think that in the process of doing that, they they have sparked a little bit of interest in in creating a French version. But no one has no one has told me it's going to actually happen. I just know there have been nibbles. Uh, no word about an audio book. Um, one chapter may show up on YouTube. I think that's probably the best we have to hope for in the short term. Um, and I also plan to transliterate at least a couple of chapters of the book and put that up on my website for those people who cannot cope with the Hebrew letters or who want a little help, who are really at an even earlier stage of their learning and want a little bit of help coping with the Hebrew letters. Um, so I, I plan to do that with at least a portion of the book and that should come quite soon. Well, perhaps to close this out, um, I'll say to everyone who's watching, please do go ahead and purchase the book if you're curious and haven't done so already. Um, and if you are interested in learning Yiddish, perhaps for the first time, Evo has a wide variety of Yiddish classes. We even have Yiddish conversational classes for those who want to learn Yiddish but are not interested in learning the alphabet. And we also have more standard classes for those who are excited to read and write themselves too. But perhaps to close, if each of you wanted to chat about something that you're working on now um, and ways in which folks can continue to connect with you in the future. Miriam? Uh, sure. So um, now that I've given you access to a pretty hefty sample of primary texts, um, it's time to talk about why they matter. So I am working right now on a critical study of Yiddish children's literature as a kind of overlooked key to understanding the Ashken Ashkenazi Jewish 20th century in particular. Um. Until recently, I've been working on cataloging a group of Yiddish, uh, Jewish manuscripts, some Yiddish, some not, at Cornell University's library. Um, 
I've been teaching a class, a Yiddish class in the community uh, in terms of writing projects. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to transliterate a couple of chapters of the Clever Little Tailor, and I've always got more translating on the back burner. So I'm going through a, a sort of vast mountain of Simon's output, uh, looking for treasures and, and, and taking them on one at a time. And I'm so grateful to you, Miriam, for having this conversation with me, and again to Yivo for hosting it. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, uh, any of your tech folks behind the scenes. And also so much to everyone who came. Thanks so much. It, it has been such a pleasure to be a part of this. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.